Mac Power Users, episode 686, Consuming Content in 2023. Hello and welcome back to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett and I'm joined as always by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. How are you, David? I'm great, Stephen. I'm looking forward to this episode. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. A little, little bit off the beaten path. You and Katie did an uh, episode on this a long time ago, and we thought it'd be good to revisit because a lot of stuff has changed in the world of media. And uh, yeah, check it back in. Yeah, consuming content. I mean, it's a thing that has like a negative connotation to it, but I, I want to get to that in a minute. But before we do, I just wanted to thank everybody for ordering the Max Sparky tees and sweatshirts. I'm wearing one of mine right now. I've been seeing pictures in uh, various social media platforms from a bunch of you that got them. Thank you so much. I love seeing that people are using them and enjoying them. And and thanks for the support, everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. They they really came out really well. Yeah. Today on More Power Users, which is the longer and ad-free version of the show, uh, we do one each and every week for our members. Uh, We are going to be talking about uh, sort of the the I.O. of our desks. And what we mean by that is, you know, how our computers are set up, what they're plugged into, sort of what the flow is. Both you and I are using uh, a bunch of USB-C stuff, and we have some docks and a lot of hard drives. And so we're going to talk through that, complete with visual aids, which will be fun. Yeah. Uh, How do two nerds connect everything? That's right. I guess that's another way to put it. Yeah. You know, it's also uh, coming up on the time for the member special shows. And Steve and I have been doing these together for years. I thought it'd be fun to just throw it out there. If you're a member, what would you like to talk us to talk about on the member special? I mean, I Steve like and I haven't talked about it yet, but we're open to ideas. That doesn't mean we're going to do your ideas. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I would say if you if you have an idea, uh, send us a note at the feedback form on the website. So if you're relay.fm slash MPU, there's a submit feedback button. There's also a link in the show notes every week. Uh, shoot us a note there. I'll make a. I'll make a new little drop down so you can uh, suggest a uh, suggest a topic real easily. And if we pick your idea, you get two gold stars. I like just it. saying. I mean, two, not just one. All right. Uh, today we're talking about consumption in 2023. It's changed a lot since the last time we talked about it on the Mac Power Users. But I also think before we even get into what we're doing to consume, I, I want to talk about the, the idea of consumption. Um, in my life over the last 10 years, I've definitely become much more interested in, um, I hesitate to say the word productivity because that's a trigger word for some people, but you know, just being more efficient and focused so much so that I have a podcast on it now. But I feel like consumption for a lot of people who think about this stuff becomes this dirty word. Like you should be creating, not consuming. And you know, every time you're consuming, you're you're not you're not making something. You're consuming somebody else's thing. And I just wanted to address that before we even get into this because I, I think it it's a bad assumption. Like consumption is not bad. Uh, creation is not always good. Uh, but the but this whole idea that you shouldn't be consuming, you should be creating all the time is a, is a rabbit hole. Like I've heard Mike Schmidt say that, but I know him like as a friend and that's not true. The guy makes a podcast where he reads a book every week. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's more finesse than that. Like consumption can be a thing where you really are giving yourself raw materials for new ideas. And that's the way I like to think about consumption. And, and it really does kind of direct the things I consume. But it's also a way to relax and it's a way to like consumption for me is a way to spend time with my family. A lot of times we mm-hmm. watch a TV show together and there's just a lot of good things about consumption. But, but you know, today's show is about uh, being a little careful with it. Like what do you pour into your brain? And um, it can be abused if you put the wrong raw materials in there. There is some stuff available on the world that does not make you a better person if you, if you consume it. And uh, maybe you should avoid that and try and think about that when you're doing your consumption. Like, does this help me or does this hurt me? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's all really well said. I think in particular, the idea that con- uh, media can tie us together, right? Like uh, I think especially the last few years where, you know, getting out in the world was, was more difficult than it used to be. So, yeah. I can keep up 
you know, with the TV show and like text my friends about it. I mean, there's we have a friend with the whole podcast network basically dedicated to this over on the incomparable. Yeah. Consumption doesn't have to be uh, a bad word. Uh, I know in, in our circles in particular, it was lobbed as a bad word at the iPad. And then it's like, oh, that's a consumption device. You can't create on an iPad. Thankfully, that argument's basically over. You can do both. It's totally fine. Uh, some yeah. people really go one direction or the other with the iPad. But it's it's really, for for me, the way I think about it is is very much in step with how you you do. I mean, you wrote this part of the outline. I was like, I have nothing to add to this. I, I agree completely. Like, it can be a, a great way to learn new things. It can be a great way to just sort of turn off for a little while. Um, but we should be uh, we should be careful about it because it, it is definitely easy to get. We spoke about this just uh, last week, right? That yeah, some notifications are are good and we need them, and then sometimes it's like too much, and so you got to find that balance in all things. And I think this is yet another area where um, it's good to talk about what makes sense and, and maybe what doesn't. Yeah, I mean, like as an example for me, uh, everybody knows that I love Star Wars, and. The reason is because I was a, a little kid when the first one came out, and you know I was I was the perfect age for that movie when it released. Um, but that being said, there's a lot of stuff I I chose not to consume because of that. Like years ago, I said, you know what, I like Star Wars, I enjoy it. I was there at the beginning, so I'm going to just ride this this train through my life, and yeah. that'll be the thing where I have encyclopedic knowledge. You ask me about Marvel. I've seen probably two thirds of the movies and I have a general idea what's going on. Usually I see the movies cause my kids want to see the movies and I don't really know what's going on, you know, and that way I've kind of limited my storytelling consumption to that one kind of like universe. And it's been great. And I love it. I look forward to this right now as we're recording this, they've got a new episode uh, season of the Mandalorian. I look forward to, to Wednesday night sitting down and watching it mm-hmm. and just, enjoying it but but yeah consumption like i said it doesn't have to just be uh reading a book to make yourself better it can also just be mindless watching a story on tv but the whole idea of this is just think about your balance and there's a couple tips i have for you on this uh for me because i'm a time tracker um and i've always been aware of this consumption creation mix in fact in my head there's really three things uh there's um there's a um, manager, creator, and consumer. And so manager is the guy who goes through all my focus and figures out what I'm going to be doing that day. And uh, creator is the guy who does it. And consumer is the guy who reads a book or watches The Mandalorian. And I actually categorize all the time that I track in one of those three titles. And at the end of the week, I've got a nice little summary of how I do it and uh, so I can say, oh, okay, so last week I spent, you know, 80% of my time creating, 10% of my time managing, 10% of my time consuming. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good mix. Uh, usually for me, it's usually like 70, 15, 15. But, you know, if I have a, if I'm working on a field guide, the, the number goes up. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and the way I do that, just to get nerdy for a minute, if you are using Timery, um, with toggle toggle has the ability to set flags or um, tags. I'm sorry, not flags tags on each save timer. So I just went through when I created the save timers and I, and I, I flagged it. Is this a manager, a creator or a consumer uh, time? And then at the end of the week, I get a nice little summary uh, in the timing app, which is the one I've been using in the last six months or so. Uh, it's the same thing. You just, trigger projects to one of those three categories and it gives you a report. And um, so in addition to knowing where I spend my time, I also at the end of the week get a nice little summary and I try to keep the consumer mix in there. I mean, I don't want it getting too low, but I don't want it getting too high either. Yeah, I think that's super smart. I don't currently time track any media consumption unless it is work related. So if I'm, working on an article or something and I'm watching an old Apple keynote, right? Well, that gets tracked yeah. for whatever project it is, but any, any, uh, let's do air quotes, recreational <laughs> content yeah. stuff. Uh, I'm not tracking, but for me, most of when that happens, cause I have three young kids, 
and own a business and do a lot of things is during exercise. And so if I'm riding my stationary bike, like currently I'm when I ride stationary bike, I've been watching The Crown on Netflix. Do okay. they had a queen yeah. in England? Who knew? It's yeah. wild. Uh, for a long time, and so I heard. And so yeah. I you know very often for me it overlaps just because of my stage of life is, is a little bit different than yours. But uh, I, I do think even if you don't time track it, it is definitely worth just just keeping an eye on and and uh, being mindful about it. I mean, really, I think that's the the underlying thing here is that we don't want to be uh, mindless or thoughtless about this because what goes into our into our brains and you know depending on what you're watching or, or listening to into your heart uh, is a big deal and it should be it should not be done lightly. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, an example is my kids watch The Bachelor, and I don't know if that makes me a failure as a parent, but they love it. And when they're here together, they watch it. It's like they make popcorn, and they, you know, they watch it again. One day, I said, "Okay, let me watch this with you," and it is, in my opinion, a terrible show. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them, "I'm like, you know, do you really want to put this in your brain?" They're like, "Dad, we work really hard. Let us have this." And I'm like, "Okay, that's fine, but I'm not going to put it in my brain." So I went in the other room and read a book, and the. Uh, so I, I'm careful about it. And I think as I get older, the weird thing is I think I get more careful about it. Like the other one that is controversial in my life is I have a bunch of friends that love the um, the Game of Thrones. Yeah. You know, I watched a few episodes of that show and it just felt like everybody in the show was terrible. And I, I just said, I just don't need this. I don't need this in my brain. I'm going to get so much email for that one because I know a lot of people like that show, mm-hmm. but I just decided I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch it. It's okay. Anyway, uh, enough of the, uh, of the preaching about all this stuff. And I, that's really not my point, but, but I would say do give some thought to what you consume and don't be afraid to consume. I think that, you know, this whole productivity thing about don't consume is a bad idea because it's consumption that gives you fuel for new ideas. And a lot of the stuff that uh, I come up with is because I consume, you know, I watch a video or something and it gives me an idea or a thought that leads me down a path. So uh, I love consumption and we're going to talk about it now. This episode of MPU is made possible by one password password manager that both David and I have used for years because it's safe and secure because it's really convenient and because it's easy to use, it doesn't get in your way. 1Password runs on all of my devices. My Mac, phone, iPad, PC, my, the Android phone I have in the drawer. It is everywhere. So all my logins and account information are always syncing behind the scenes. So when I go to log into an app that I install on my phone, and maybe I create an account on my computer earlier, it's just there waiting for me. And 1Password takes advantage of all the awesome features in these operating systems. So I can use Face ID and Touch ID to log in. I can use the really cool uh, password autofill thing in the keyboard in iOS and iPadOS. I, I love that feature. I can just tap the little password button, pull in my account information. And of course, if I'm in Chrome or Safari, the browser extensions are great as well. 1Password has accounts both for families and teams. So you can use 1Password with everyone in your life, sharing information, managing who has access to it, and keeping everybody safe and secure. One of my favorite features is the ability to create and store banking information. I had this recently at work where I needed to send somebody our routing and account information. You know, back in the day, maybe I'd keep a voided check in my desk and I'd pull it out and type in all the numbers. It's a lot of zeros to get wrong but I just have that saved in 1Password so I can very quickly grab those fields and send them on their way. You can learn more and sign up for a free 30-day trial. Just go to onepasswordcom slash MPU. There's a link in the show notes to that. It's onepasswordcom slash MPU. You'll get a free 30-day trial and you'll get 20% off when you decide to sign up. Our thanks to 1Password for the support of the show. Stephen, uh, I want to talk about reading books. This is a thing that comes up on our show once in a while. Uh, people definitely have opinions about ebooks versus physical books and, and what we're doing. What's your current system? Mine has uh, really been in flux 
um, I've alluded to this before, but I'm I'm taking a class this semester, and it's like it's basically like being back in college. <laughs> so I'm doing a lot of reading, and and in that class, it has been strongly encouraged us to read actual like physical paper books. And my mm. personal reading like over a decade now, a long time, almost exclusively has been on the Kindle. And I've, I've had a series of Kindles over the years. I like the e-ink environment. I like that it's not my iPad, et cetera, et cetera. All the reasons people like Kindles are the same reasons I like the Kindles. Um, but I have been doing a lot of reading the last, uh, call it six weeks, in actual like books. I've got a stack right there on my desk that i got to finish this week. And, um, and so it's a little all, all over the place. I've also been trying Apple Books. Uh, which is, you know, it's been around for, I don't know, like 12, 11 or 12 years and a couple, gotten a couple of redesigns, got a pretty big redesign, I think last year. And I just haven't read in Apple books since it was like iBooks back in the day. And yeah. so I also have a couple of books in there. Uh, one of them I'm like halfway through just to like get a feel for what that app is like. And while it is kind of cool to like just have, a book on my phone. I also just have that with the Kindle app. So some of the, I think some of the things people say about Apple books being like on all your devices, like, well, that's also true for Kindle and, and other e-ink kind of ecosystems. So mostly Kindle paper books, when I'm told to, and then I've been playing with Apple books. Yeah. We should point out that last week, Apple released 16.4 for iOS, which added the page turn back to Apple books. Yeah. You know, I'm, the I'm actually a big turn. fan this is going to be a hot take. Okay, hot take incoming. I'm actually a big fan of the sliding panels they added when they got rid of the page turn. Uh, I, like, I like the way that looks. I do not like reading an Apple Books or really any digital reader uh, that scrolls. And you can do that in Apple Books, but it's um, to me that feels too much like I'm reading on the web in a way I can't quite put my finger on. And so I... um. I like the the sliding panel look on uh, on Apple Books. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm ambivalent. Uh, one of the nice things about the scrolling is if you're highlighting, yes, and you you never have it like over two pages. But uh, I need to unpack a bit there. So okay. because of your class, you're required to read physical books, and you're a guy who hasn't done that for a long time. Are you finding the experience different? I think so. Uh, I think primarily in how I store and save highlights. So I'm a big highlighter when I read books. Um, yeah. I'm not really a note taker in books, but you know, if there's a paragraph or a line, you know, I'll, I'll highlight it somehow. And on the Kindle or other e-readers, you know, it's relatively simple. You just put your thumb down and, and you highlight it and then you can export. So both Kindle for Mac and the Apple books app on the Mac will let you export your highlights. And then yeah. I, st- I I don't have like the fancy Readwise system you do. What I do yeah. is I create an Apple note with the name of the book and I paste all my notes in that note. <laughs> and if I ever need to go no. back, I can see them in there. That Not, is totally fine. Yeah, totally and fine. Probably pretty straightforward. Pretty simple. It's expensive than what I'm doing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Apple notes yeah. just comes for free. Do you have a problem with staying focused when you're reading like Apple books? Do you, that That's the big knock against eBooks is that um, you can't stay engaged with the material because of notifications and all that stuff. I mean, if you put your phone and do not disturb, then it's not that that big of an issue. Yeah, um, I haven't I haven't found that to be a big problem, but I can understand why some that would turn some people off. One hundred percent. Yeah, I think that is the thing, right? I think for a lot of people uh, that prefer analog books, they they say, "I want the." the experience of turning pages and I like seeing it on my shelf. And for all that stuff for me, none of that lands because I grew up where books were everywhere. And I went to law school where it was like 50 pounds of books you were carrying around. And so I've had the analog experience up to my eyeballs. Mm -hmm. I I don't need, I don't need that anymore. Um, and, And also I have like a sickness in terms of like, I love to have clutter free. I love to get rid of stuff and, Man, when I finish a book, I just can't wait to give it to somebody or just mm-hmm. donate to the library. I just don't want the stuff around. Yeah. So, so the digital books always land for me because they don't take. I don't need a shelf for them, and 
And I really like, like you, I like the highlighting process on the digital books and I go to Readwise, you know? So Readwise is, it's a paid for service. I'm a big fan. Um, the thing I like about it is in addition to just collecting your highlights out of your books, it can get them off the web. And, and there's even another feature we're going to talk about in a minute that I use with it. But um, every morning I open the app and it does spaced repetition for me. So it takes 10 random highlights that I've made over the years that I've been reading Kindle books and it's been a long time and it just throws them at me Mm -hmm. and I can tell it things like, don't give me this book as frequently or give me this book more, but I can favorite them, but it starts to figure out the kind of stuff I want to read. Yeah. And I, I really uh, like that because, you know, one of the problems with reading a book for a lot of folks is you read the book but you never act on it. It never changes anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about nonfiction here. You know, like if you read a book that talks about what's the best way to, you know, I don't know, run your calendar or meditate or whatever it is you're reading a book about or, or, or how to, you know, eating habits. Do you actually change the way you eat after you read the book or you do put it down and say, well, that was a good book. Those were some good ideas. And then you just move on with your life. Well, space repetition kind of forces it back at you. And I, I find that a very uh, a good way to go. So yeah. anyway, uh, so, so I use it with Readwise. So I pay for it for that reason. But uh, I don't either find the, the 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 big knock against these eBooks. Like I was getting to the point earlier, is that they're they're interruption devices. If you're holding an iPad, you're just as likely to go on Facebook or name your social media network or open YouTube or you know do work or anything other than read the book. Um, and there is science behind that. There's a bunch of people done studies and, and say, yeah, it's really hard for people to focus on books, but this episode just happens to follow an episode where we talked in depth about that stuff. And I strongly believe that if you want to read digital books, you can do that without them being interruption devices. And if you want to know how, just listen to last week's episode. Mm -hmm. And like you, I have gravitated to buying Kindle books and using a Kindle reading device. Um, last year, I went nuts and bought the big one. You know, they released that new yeah, one. Yeah, the Scribe. Yeah, and it's a you know it's terrible at all the stuff that people buy. The big you know it's not a good note taking device. It's not you know it's like um, Mike Schmidt calling out to Mike Schmitz again. He's using some Android. I think it's called a book something or whatever. It's like an Android tablet that's e ink, and he runs Obsidian on it and does a whole bunch of stuff. I just want to read books on the damn thing. And Mm -hmm. this one has a really high resolution. So the book pages look good and I highlight it with the pen. And that's the only thing I use it for. Yeah. Um, uh, Another big, I guess I should stop there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I wanted to close the loop on, on highlighting because like in this class, right, I'm reading a bunch of books, highlighting, taking some notes and I want to be able to store those highlights in a way that I can search. And the first couple of books, I, you know, I'd highlight and then I'd sit down at my desk and I would, I was like, okay, do I scan these pages? Do I take pictures of them and let like iOS do its cool text magic and pull text out of the images? And then, David, it was like you were a little angel and you came down and you sat on my shoulder and you whispered in my ear, Stephen, use dictation. And so what I've been doing is with these highlights in these paperback books I'm reading for this class is I'll sit down, I'll I'll hit the F5 on my keyboard, and I will just read out loud the highlight. That is two things. One, I'm much more prone to remember it because I talk for a living. That's how my brain works. Yeah. Uh, And I'm not typing it in, right? It just, it goes in. Yeah, you got to like fix things up. And, you know, this is a, this class has some like pretty big terminology. You know, there's a dictionary that comes with this class basically. So sometimes it doesn't know the word. You got to like tidy it up. But it gets 95% of the way there on its own. And that's been uh that's been pretty cool. That's been a a, a pretty good uh little workflow for me. So uh man, now, now I have so many questions. Uh so are you just using the basic dictation? Yep, just built into Mac OS. Yeah, okay. And are you so I guess it's working it said was about ninety five percent accurate for you? Yeah, it really gets it. Now I do think that me um, being like a professional voice person helps because like I can do the, it helps if you kind of go, I found 
it helps you go a little over the top. Like, I don't want to say the word question mark, but if I make it really sound like a question, it infers there's supposed to be a question mark there. That sort of yeah. thing. So your mileage may vary. Uh, I'm also speaking into, I mean, I hook up my podcast stuff. So like, I'm using a nice microphone. It can hear me really well. But it's been, I've been really surprised at how accurate it is just right out of the box. So are you just reading quotes from the book in? Mm-hmm. Is that how you're doing it? Yeah. Yep. So that's another thing that will help because if you dictate and you don't, you start a sentence and you don't know how it's going to end, that causes problems for dictation because you pause and you're not sure and you put fill in words. In your case, you're reading something. So that's kind of ideal for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. If you do you add any of your own analysis like at the end? Yeah. So how I'm doing it is I'll have like a, a bullet point with the paragraph or the couple of lines I, I quote highlighted. And then I'll do in my notes uh, bullet points under that, like indented in of like my, you know, hey, this is what this word means, or this is kind of why I highlighted it. You know, whatever I need to sort of like uh, kind of jog my memory when I go back through it. Yeah. So I am, because I read an analog book just a few months ago. My friend Chris Bailey wrote that book, Calm which, by the way, is a great book. <laughs> um, it really kind of tracks with the stuff we've been talking in about the last few weeks. And, and in Chris's book, he strongly recommends you read analog books. He says, don't do it in digital. But anyway. <laughs> so, so that's Chris's book is the book that I've been reading in Apple Books. And I realized only just now the irony of that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I actually texted him about it. I'm like, hey, you know what? That doesn't work for me. And he's like, well, whatever works for you. But but I think for a lot of people, the concern that these that a lot of folks have is that the digital stuff is going to be a distraction device and you're not going to be able to fully engage with it. And I think when reading a book, that's a real legitimate concern. Yeah. Because reading a book is more than just reading the book. It's actually it's a conversation with the author. You should be arguing with the author in your head. You should be really trying to understand everything they're saying and deciding whether or not that, that works with you or not. And, you know, there's a lot of books I read. I don't agree with all of it, but maybe I agree with 20% and that's enough to make a change. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I do think with an analog book, there is zero risk that you are going to be distracted by a text message come in or, um, think about, oh, I could go over to YouTube and watch that cool video right now. You just That will never happen when you're reading a book. So that's the safe route. I think the safer route, I mean, the less safe route is the Kindle, which doesn't have connection to all your devices. And then the, the risky move there is the iPad. But uh, like we said last week, just set up a focus mode for reading and shut all that stuff down yep. and, and read the book. I, I, I think people are making too much out of this. But but for me, the, the payoff is that Readwise integration and having the ability to highlight stuff. Um, I When I read Chris's book, though, the Calm book, I did the same thing like you. I dictated, but I also wrote some of my highlights in. But I definitely took fewer highlights. And the way I read a book is I take a lot of highlights, and then it imports into Obsidian for me. And then I go through Obsidian, and I highlight the highlights. You know, I kind of boil it down over time. And... And having a big group of highlights then make it into a smaller group of highlights, it really allows me to process a book and figure out what what's in that book that really matters to me. Um, and with Chris's book, it was harder to do because I didn't have digital copy. In fact, I ended up just buying a Kindle copy eventually and uh, do the highlights the way I always do them. I tend to be the the same way. If I'm reading a digital book, I'm just it's highlight city because it's so easy. Yeah, and and that's cool because. It just gives you a lot to think about. And with the Readwise uh, system, you know, I make a lot of highlights, but then three years later, one of them will randomly show up in front of my eyeballs and make me think for a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about reading on the web. You know, it's a big part of what both you and I do in our jobs. It's what a lot of our listeners do because we're all interested in the same stuff. We did do a really in-depth episode about RSS a couple of years ago, so that'll be in the show notes. Um, so I think we can keep this uh, a little bit a little bit briefer. But uh, what are you doing for your RSS reading? And uh, and I'm really curious, particularly for you, because I think your your answer may be more interesting than mine. Is what devices or what context do you read through RSS? Yeah, uh, mine has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, I switched over to Reader with two E's after we made that episode. 
and uh, and that's a great little app. And now they they do the uh, their own uh, service where they use your iCloud account, and you know they they give the feeds to you, so it's very easy. But the only thing I put in there are tech feeds. You know, part of my job is to keep up with what's going on with Apple. So um, I open that app in order to do that. But for the stuff that makes me think and isn't related to the tech nerd job, I have switched to uh, a new Readwise product. It's currently in beta, but it's a public beta called Readwise Reader. And the the people behind Readwise uh, are trying to change the world, you know, as so many app developers do, right? But these guys are really onto something, and they've made their own reader software. It's an RSS, but it's also you can send books to it from the Readwise app. I mean, it's a, it collects stuff from the web and other sources for you, and you can go through that and highlight it in there, and then it goes into the Readwise space right petition system, and it gets sent over to Obsidian. And it, it just like ties into their whole network of features. So they've essentially said, okay, we've already got books covered with the Readwise service for Kindle and uh, uh, Apple Books and whatnot. So now we want to do something for the stuff you read on the web. And I've been using it two or three months now. I haven't said much publicly about it because I really wanted to get my workflows nailed down before I start sharing a bunch, but I'm hooked. Yeah, I've heard uh, John Voorhees and Federico Vitici of our Mac Stories talk about this as well. And uh, it does seem really awesome. I, I think one of my favorite things about it, uh, ha- having not used it, I'm not in on the beta, but... Yeah, looking through it and hearing people talk about it is the different types of content you can get into it. It's not just RSS. Like you can bring YouTube into it. You can bring PDFs and newsletters into it. Uh, that's one reason I use Feedbin is because I can set up like Substack, right? So I subscribe to a couple different writers on Substack. That's an email newsletter. Same thing with uh, Shortechery by our friend Ben Thompson. And Instead of this coming to my inbox because I don't need anything else in my inbox, I have those go to Feedbin through like a special hidden email address they give you. And so those show up as if they were published via RSS, even though really on the back end of their email. And I think that idea is really interesting because for so much of this, the app and the context in which we consume is based on the media. And like Readwise and Feedbin and some others are kind of breaking those walls down a little bit. Like, yeah. You know, totally. Oh, you can actually like pipe YouTube videos into this or newsletters or Twitter threads, all sorts of stuff. And I think I think you're even pushing it further by saying, I sort of have this bucket, this app, this service for tech. I have this other service and tool set for non-tech. And I like that. And in fact, I think the biggest thing that's happened in RSS since we recorded that episode is tools like this that add on to, okay, this is more than just subscribing to a bunch of WordPress feeds, right? You can you can do other things. You can kind of have a whole environment end to end. And I think it's really cool. And I think, I mean, Readwise Readers is one of those things that's on my list to check out. I just haven't gotten to. But um, it does look really neat. And I do think that that sort of collation of multiple um, sources and, and source types is can be really powerful. And, and ultimately... Make this more efficient. So you're not checking a bunch of other things. You're going to have one place, you you know, one quote unquote inbox you go check and then you can move on. Yeah. And honestly, I may at some point just move the tech stuff into Readwise as well. Yeah. But but right now I really like the way I've got that segregated. And, you know, when I'm doing the work research, I go in Readwise. In fact, I can, you know, get back to tracking consumer manager creator. I mean, that that matters where mm-hmm. I'm at. Uh, I would really love to have you try Readwise in full for three months and then come back and tell us what you think about it as someone who hasn't. Um, but uh, maybe if you have time, you should try that. Because I feel like you're you're so close to there already. I mean, you're using Kindle and iBooks that works with all that stuff. Um, you're looking for better ways to manage RSS. And uh, I know I sound like a um, like I'm trying to convince you to join a cult, but mm. the uh, but it's just a really interesting and innovative service, and the developers are clearly trying to make this stuff easier 
to get and retain knowledge. Because like I always love the way I could get those space repetition highlights out of a book, but sometimes I read a an article on the web that is equally influencing on me and something that I do want to be thinking about in the future. And I do want a highlight to come back to me in three years. And uh, now I can do that with Readwise because you just go through in the app, you highlight something, it goes into the space repetition system, just like everything else. Also, it hooks into Obsidian. So you can actually send those highlights to Obsidian and make it the basis of a note or uh, research or something you're thinking about. It's just a really nice system. And uh, it's, like I said, I believe it's a public beta now. If anybody's listening and they want to try it, just go to readwise.io and um, check it out. But it is, uh, it's it's a really nice way to uh, to consume. Just to, to close the loop on my setup, uh, it is Feedbin as the service and then Reader with two E's uh, as the app. And that I explore other RSS apps from time to time, but I always end up coming back to Reader and uh, and for my read it later, like save it later, I'm using good links. So r- really, my setup has been really pretty static, but um, but I've been happy with it and, it and it works for me. But there there is a lot of innovation in this in this corner of app, um, especially this is not the read it later <laughs> uh, episode, but especially in that category of app, there's a lot of cool stuff going on all of a sudden. And that makes me yeah. uh, that makes me happy. Yeah, well, and that's Readwise Reader is that too. It's a read it later service as well. And um, it may not be as feature rich as some of the others, but with the combination with the space repetition system, it's the one I'll probably be landing with. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Setup. Go to stpp.co slash Mac Power Users and get a free seven day trial of more than 230 powerful apps. With all the tools available to us now, looking for something new to improve the way we work can feel like drowning in an ocean of different apps and services. And what's more, so many of us are paying for apps and services that have never properly integrated into our workflows. So how do you know which apps are worth trying without emptying your wallet on a subscription that you might forget to cancel in the future? The answer is Setup. Setup is a platform that combines more than 230 powerful Mac OS and iOS apps and tools under one $9.99 a month subscription. Their selection of apps is super helpful for people who use their Macs to do work, covering complete use cases like coding, designing, project and time management, and more. Once subscribed, you get full access to all paid features of these apps, as well as new apps that are constantly being added. So you'll always be sure you're not missing out on anything that can actually help you do your work more efficiently, all for just a fraction of the price. SetApp is a smart way to get apps for people who create value with the help of their Apple devices. It takes away the pain of looking up, comparing, buying, and managing separate apps, and they partner with some of the world's best developers to handpick the most trustworthy and advanced paid apps for SetApp. When it comes to Setup, I was an early adopter. I got on board as soon as they announced the service because there are a lot of little utility apps out there that I wanted access to. And I have to tell you, the people at Setup are definitely losing money on me because I am using so many apps from them. I canceled a bunch of subscriptions when I signed up for Setup, and I'm constantly finding new apps in the Setup stable that I find as real useful applications that I put into use. I mean, some of the MPU greatest hits are in there, Better Touch Tool, Ulysses, Bartender, and Gemini. But we also constantly stumble into other little apps that uh, we find really useful, like Paste is a good one. We talked about that extensively on our clipboard episode, and that's just in Setup. If you subscribe to Setup, you get that for free. If you want to be more productive with your Mac, you should definitely check this out. And when you think of all the dumb things we spend money on, 10 bucks a month to have access to an excellent library of productivity apps is an easy spend. Set up, make sure you remove outdated tools to keep the collection up to date with the best software around. You always get the most recent version of those set up apps. If you've got a complex task to solve, you can delve into their app collections. And for peace of mind, every app is updated automatically with no annoying ads to distract you. And you can install and uninstall apps with a single click. 
So check out SetApp today by trying it out for seven days for free. Go to stpp.co slash MacPowerUsers. That's stpp.co slash MacPowerUsers to try it completely free for seven days. SetApp powers you up, and our thanks to SetApp for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, television slash streaming services. I think for a lot of people, myself included, that's basically just one category, right? I've, I've, I'm not a cord cutter. I, I never actually had ever. I've had cable. I've always been just over-the-top sort of services, and that's where the world is definitely going. I think this uh, section in particular shows the difference in our life stages. Like, (laughs) I got a lot of stuff for kids on my list. Um, Yeah. uh, But then again, Disney Plus is the first on on yours, uh, I'm sure, because of uh, the the (laughs) Star Wars and Disney connection. But um, how do you, uh, what services are you using? How do you go about this? What works for you? Yeah, I actually think of this category just as video. Really, yeah. more than um, uh, television and streaming. But it's be- definitely been an evolution. If you go back 10, 15 years on the show, I was talking about ripping DVDs because when my kids were little. You know, anybody who has little kids knows that strangely they can watch a movie, you know, 20 times and be happy. So we would, you know, if there was one that we'd, we'd buy a video, we would never steal it. But if they really liked it and we didn't want to worry about them putting peanut butter on it, we would make a copy and then they could watch it to their heart's content. Um, Now that's not a problem for parents anymore, right? Um, uh, Disney plus is amazing. There's so much content in Mm -hmm. there and there are some other streaming services that are also catering to children that have a lot of content. I mean, Apple um, TV plus as well. They have the peanuts and some, some good content in there. We did that interview on with the, about the, you know, the, content and video streaming services last year. So I, I think we can kind of just reference that. But I, yeah, we like the Disney stuff. My wife works for the company and she loves Disney a lot. Um, so, so we watch the, we watch all the um, red herring stuff and the little stuff the the Imagineering series was amazing to us. And so we watch a lot of Disney content. In fact, if you have the Disney channel, and you're an adult, I have a, I have a recommendation for you that nobody knows about. The, um, we just found this out a couple of weeks ago, you know, that the original Bambi movie is on Disney plus, you know, and of course Bambi is a really old movie. Uh, but Walt was really into trying to figure out the process. I mean, the, the, um, anybody who's an Apple fan, I feel like the connection between Walt Disney and Steve Jobs is very similar. And I think they're very different people and had different personalities, but the way they thought about, you know, betting the company over and over again is interesting. And so he would have a, a stenographer sit in on the creative meetings while they were figuring out how to make the movie. And in the extras for the Bambi movie, they had actors read those transcripts. And it's fascinating you know, I mean, this is set, I don't know what, I think it was in the 30s that this was, mm-hmm. 1930s. This, but I mean, it's the same stuff we're talking about now when we're making content. It's the exact same issues and uh, very interesting to me. But anyway, so yeah, we watch a lot of Disney Plus. And then yeah. uh, I like Star Wars, so we watch a lot of that content too. In fact, they added a thing now um, where they have, uh, it's just like the noises of Star Wars with like random kind of video in the background. And sometimes I'll just play that. Uh, I have to have a noise almost 24-7 because my ears are constantly ringing with tinnitus. Mm-hmm. So I, I am either playing dark noise or some kind of noise. And uh, sometimes the TV plays a, a role in that. Yeah, we, we also are big uh, Disney Plus uh, people over here. I have been really impressed with their with their breadth of content. Like you said, kid stuff, adult stuff. The Imagineers uh, series is just unbelievable. I mean, I watched the whole thing just like with my mouth on the floor, just the, the, the yeah. work that these people do. Yeah. But, um, I, I have Disney Plus as part of the Hulu ESPN Plus Disney Plus bundle because I also watch a lot of sports. And the best way to do that is 
combination of Hulu Live TV and ESPN Plus. My local university where I graduated has their streaming rights through ESPN Plus. So if the Tigers have a game that for some reason is not nationally televised, then it's on ESPN Plus and you can just stream it. And uh, that bundle saved me quite a bit of money. And so I've, I've been doing that for a while now. Actually, probably since it came out. And I will um, uh, definitely vouch for it that if you are looking at more than one of these services from the Disney Empire, the bundle would probably make sense for you. Um, so I, I got a link to the, the show notes there. Because uh, in the past, I would have like Hulu Live TV and I would just turn it on and off, right? Like during basketball and football season to be on. In the summer when it's just boring baseball, I would turn it off. And then in the fall, you know, turn it back on. Uh, but with the bundle, Disney Plus and Hulu year round, uh, that that has really worked well for us. And it's, um, I mean, it's you know, most of this is on the Apple TV. Uh, my kids, you know, our family, the Apple TV is the television. It's the default input. They really don't know anything else. Uh, but of course, these apps also exist on the iPad. So you know, if I get banished, uh, I can't watch basketball in the den with a nice big TV. I can watch it on on the iPad Mini. You know. Uh, in the hammock or, you know, in our bedroom or something like that. Yeah. And that that's the downside of being a cord cutter or never having a cord is sports. Like live yes. event sports is, is really difficult. Uh, I have not been a sports fan for a long time. I used to be really into it when I was younger, but somewhere along the line between the law practice and Max Barkey and everything else I was doing, I just kind of let sports go. But my younger daughter is a uh, is a junior at UCLA, and she is one hundred percent a UCLA basketball fan, which has kind of infected the rest of us. Which makes sense at UCLA, you know, John Wooden and all that. Yeah, and uh, so we watch the Final Four, and you know, but but we just she has access as a student to some feed, and then she just airplayed it to the TV. That's cool. But like, if you like sports, you gotta you really do have to find a solution for streaming. Um, and that's kind of another thing about streaming. Like, how do you deal with that when like there's like a major news event or something, if you're a cord cutter and you really want to just keep up with the news or there's a major sporting event, or in my case, the Olympics, I just got done saying I'm not a sports fan, but there's something about the Olympics that, that gets me every yes. year. And yeah. it's the stories about these people. They're not, none of them are going to become millionaires because of what they're doing, or most of them won't. And but they but nevertheless they've dedicated their life to this night. I'm just so compelled to watch it. And the way I deal with that is every four, oh, I guess every two years, I subscribe to a month or two of YouTube TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, listeners, feel free to let us know if there's better ways to do this. But I find this so easy. I think it's twenty or thirty bucks every time I do it. It's a little more than the last time. Oh, it's more than that now. It's like uh, they just their price just went up again. It's like. 70 something a month now for the, yikes, for the full thing. Yeah. But you know, if you just want to easily get TV access, like having a cable yeah, uh, for a month or two, YouTube TV, you know, you pay it through your, your iPhone and they turn it on and it works on all your devices. It has built in DVR stuff. Like I got really into soccer, uh, football, sorry. Um, at the last Olympics. So I had to record all that. I was a fencer in high school. Uh, so I would watch all that coverage and it's just fun and that's an easy way to do it. There, there may be cheaper ways now that, especially if it's $70, but the, uh, but it takes almost no time to set that up and just remember to turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the, the key or you end up paying for it longer than, than you need to. Uh, but you know, in, in those moments, you mentioned something, you know, sort of like the those moments are like everyone's watching TV, right? It's breaking news, something like that. A lot of that stuff is streamed by the major networks, just like on yeah. their websites, right? So yeah. CNN or whoever may stream presidential debates or you know some big national story. And so you're not necessarily always out left in the cold, but the reason Hulu and YouTube and others have this sort of like TV-like service is because they're trying to recreate what it's like to have cable, what it's like to have a bunch of TV stations and you flip through them. I mean, down to the UI, right? Like no one has really ever improved on the, you know, this is a list of channels and what time things come on. All these services have 
yeah. <laughs> have that same same look and feel. And uh, I think it's that's because because it works. And uh, I think my my sort of overall thing here is I reevaluate these services, you know, on a on a fairly regular basis. Like one, quite honestly, that's on the pr- pretty close to being on the chopping block for us is Netflix. Uh, I'm currently watching a Netflix show, but before then, you know, I don't really know the last time we like, sat down and, and really watched something on Netflix. Now the kids watch some stuff there, and so that's you know gets taken into account, I guess. But if it were just me and Mary, Netflix would be gone uh, because the other things have sort of taken over it. Or I have them, you know, something like Amazon Prime Video. We have because we pay for Amazon Prime, right? It just yeah. comes bundled with it. And there's a lot of great stuff there. And Netflix has like fallen from its perch, I think, to a degree, at least in the US, because there's so much other good stuff. I mean, heck, Apple's making really good TV shows. And if, if you and Katie had talked about that on that old episode, it's like people's minds would have like been blown. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's so much good stuff out there now. And so um, it's easy to pay for it all and pay for more than what it would be if you were paying Spectrum or Comcast or whoever for cable TV. So you kind of got to keep an eye on it, I think. Yeah. And that is, you know, when you live with other humans, that is part of this whole equation when you're choosing how to consume streaming services. Like for instance, my HBO, I had paid for a year and it was coming up for renewal. And I thought, well, we don't need this. And I just texted out to the family thread. Hey, is anybody using HBO? And like all three of them were like going to come for me. If I, if I stopped HBO, they all had things that they wanted on HBO. So, okay. They get another year. Um, the, if you're doing this, if you're making this move or already have, you should really talk to the people that are important to you and find out what it is that they really want to see. Like um, if your significant other is really into sports, then you should have solutions for her or his sports team so they can still watch it. Um, my wife loves the Hallmark Channel. You know, she just loves those shows. I'm, uh, you know, she'll tell you, you know, you know how they're going to end. It's like, you know, um, kind of junk food. I shouldn't say junk food, but it's just, you know, it's very, um, they're very simple stories yeah. and they always kind of end the same. But when she says she's working around the house and stuff, they make her happy. And I knew that when we cut the cord, I had to have a solution for that for her or it wasn't going to work. And I found uh, a, a service called friendly TV. And I think it's like 50 bucks a year. And it basically has all the Hallmark stuff on it and other stuff that she likes and she's happy, you know, and, uh, but you do need to kind of think through all that stuff when you're, when you're trying to make this move, you got to make sure everybody that likes to consume stuff is going to be able to get the stuff they like to consume. Yeah, definitely. It's complicated to keep up with that. Uh, the, the tool that I use to keep up with it is an app called just watch. And this lets you basically search for whatever you want to watch. And it tells you what services it's available on. And if it's free with that service, or maybe, you know, sometimes this happens with Apple or Amazon. Oh, it's on Amazon prime, but it's like four bucks and it it will tell you that. And you can, you know, jump right to it. Uh, So just watch is, uh, I think (laughs) uh, in in a way it's the modern equivalent to the TV guide, right? Because it knows about a bunch of these different services. In the last year, I found a new streaming service that I signed up for for myself that I really like and I want to recommend to everybody. It's called Curiosity Stream. Yeah. Have you heard of this one? Yes. Uh, it is really cool. Uh, I guess the fine print is they sponsored Relay a long time ago, but that was uh, years okay. ago and they didn't give me a free membership. Uh, but it is really cool. It's like documentaries and educational programming about basically anything you could ever imagine. Yeah, it's like thousands of documentaries. And uh, I always have a joke when I find these educational shows. I was like, what is the Hitler ratio, right? If you go on the channel and like every 10th one is about Hitler, then I don't want to (laughs) subscribe. You know, Hitler ratio is super low here. I mean, I rarely see anything about Hitler in here. So I'm like, okay. That's good. They They actually want to teach me something. They're not here to just like... I don't know, stoke you. Um, but the uh, it's great, and it's not that expensive. I think it's like 40 bucks a year, 
if you buy it for a year. And I find myself watching this constantly now. And that has been one of the good pieces of content that I'm pouring into my brain. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I subscribed to it for a while and I sort of watched what I wanted to, but that's been years. Uh, that may be something to to revisit at some point because there's really not much like it. And and they're just one example. There are others of these services that are kind of specific, right? Like, okay, we do really like interesting, good, high quality documentaries. That's all we do, but there's thousands of them, right? There are other examples, but I think they do a really good job over there. And it's it's a really cool service. I like it a lot. The streaming service that neither one of us have mentioned that for me is by far the most watched is YouTube. Yep. Uh, there may be because I'm a podcaster. I don't know. But I love the democratized nature of YouTube. There's so much stuff there. A lot of it's garbage, but a lot of it is really good. And if you find people that you like, you can follow them and keep up with what they're teaching. And like Gray, you know, another guy on our network makes amazing videos for YouTube. But no matter what your interest is, there's somebody covering it. Like I am, you know, as you know, I've been a couple of my hobbies, bonsai, saxophone, and and woodworking Mm -hmm. for each one of those. There are people on YouTube who do nothing but that all the time and have tons of wisdom to share that I would have killed for when I was a kid, you know, getting that access so quickly. Last night I was trying to get a camber on a smoothing plane blade. You know, it's like, where would you go to get a book on that? I don't know. But with one search on Google, I found three videos with people who do it all the time showing me how to do it. And I don't know where you get stuff like that. I mean, Curiosity Stream can't give me that. You know, there's just nothing in the world like YouTube for that kind of specialized knowledge. And sometimes the production quality isn't great, but you still get the information. I, I love YouTube so much. It's absolutely incredible the the breadth of content there. Uh, I do subscribe to YouTube Premium, which gives you YouTube Music, which I don't use, uh, but it gives you. Um, Ad free experience, <laughs> which is the big free. thing for me. Uh, yeah. But you can also download things and play in the background, which they've like turned on and off for non premium people on the iOS client. I don't know what the current state of that is, but I do it for the ad free. Um, and I've heard so many creators who I both know or just watch saying that premium is, is a pretty good deal for them too. And so that makes me feel, um, feel good about that so i've I've subscribed to youtube premium since it was youtube red back in the day before they yeah. kind of rebranded it a few years ago and i'm at a point now where if i you know see somebody pull up a youtube video and there's like a, a pre-roll ad i'm like oh that's weird i haven't I haven't seen one of those in a long time yeah yeah i i think um if you are out there thinking well i don't want to watch youtube it's a you know it's a bunch of kids pulling pranks or whatever whatever you think it is um, think of some obscure thing you're interested in. <laughs> I just watched another video the other day, how to make better gumbo, right? I mean, whatever it is you're interested in, yeah. there's some videos out there. Now, I'm not saying every person that makes a video about it has good advice or knows what the heck they're talking about, but you'll find the ones that, that people do like. I mean, it's easy enough. Even just the view count is a really good indicator of good information uh, when you're looking for specialized knowledge. But I just, I'm just fascinated by how much I learned from that. Like I, I never understood the Ottoman empire. Did you ever learn about that in school? I feel like I did, but I don't think any of it stuck. I heard it talked about on a podcast. I was watching recently. I'm like, I don't really understand it, but I was cleaning the studio. So I just said, YouTube, you know, give me a explainer on the Ottoman empire. Some guy made like a 45 minute video going through the whole thing. And now I get it. Right. And it's like, where in the world can you get that on demand like that? I mean, we live in a, in a great time. Mm-hmm. I know sometimes technology causes trouble and can make us nuts, but it's also such an opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's definitely true. I mean, I, I think I've told this story before, but, you know, fixing a washing machine, like <laughs> working on my truck, whatever it may be, like you can find somebody who's done it. Um, I've got to replace like part of the front bumper on my pickup after a little fender bender recently. Yeah. And uh, 
was like, oh, can I do this myself, right? I'm pretty handy. I got a bunch of tools. And so I went on YouTube, found like four videos of people showing this is how this part comes off. Like here's the little the clips you need. Here's sort of the gotcha. Like when you're installing it, it looks like you come from this side, but if you come from this side, it's way easier. All that yeah. stuff. Um, I mean, you have, you like podcasting, you have a very wide range of quality, uh, both in production and content, like you referenced earlier. But YouTube is kind of feels, I put it in the same boat as Wikipedia. They both kind of feel like modern miracles in a way. Yeah. In fact, you know, did I ever tell you the moment I decided to stop making um, writing books and start making field guides? Mm mm. Because I wrote a couple books for like a publisher, you know, yeah, iPad yeah. at work, I, Mac I've at work. I've got at least at least a couple of them. Um, so I got a new razor, and I wanted to figure out how to clean it. And it it was a you know it's electric razor, and I said, well, there must be somebody that could teach me that knows what they're doing. So I went on YouTube and I watched a video about how to clean that specific razor. And then like it hit me halfway through watching that video. Oh wait a second, this is where. People go to learn now. They go to video. They don't want books anymore. They want someone to just show them. And then that's what led me down the road that makes field guides videos now. I mean, it, because I got a new razor. <laughs> you know, and that, that's actually an example of the consumption creation balance. You know, consuming something, how a video how to clean a razor led to me making a fundamental change into how I create. So it, it, this stuff all works together. This episode of MPU is made possible by Squarespace. Squarespace is the place you should go when you're looking to build a website online. It doesn't matter what the website's going to do. Maybe you just need to have a, a simple landing page. Maybe you're going to have a URL uh, on that job resume and you want something that looks really professional. Or maybe you're starting a business and want to gather people to your store. Maybe you want to sell things online or host a blog or a podcast, whatever it is. Squarespace has you covered. Their tools make it really easy to share your stories. Uh, with their blogging engine, you can share stories, post videos and updates, complete with categories, easy sharing tools, and even scheduling. So you can have your post ready to go so your website is working for you when you're off doing something else. And if you want to get those stories into the hands of visitors, you can encourage them to sign up to an email campaign. You can do that right within Squarespace. You start with an awesome email template from Squarespace. You customize it to match your brand and site colors. And then their built-in analytics measure how each email campaign goes. I absolutely love building on Squarespace. My brother runs a nonprofit. He has a giant site on Squarespace we built several years ago. And he's been working on overhauling it, updating some of the content, adding some new images. And he's not texting me all the time asking questions because Squarespace is really easy for him to add and change his content over time and uh, and do it in a way where he's not afraid of breaking the site. That's something I really appreciate about Squarespace. You can appreciate it too. Just go to squarespace.com slash MPU for a free trial. There is no credit card required. When you're ready to launch, use the offer code MPU to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase and to show you support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So let's talk about listening. Let's talk about audio, something that's obviously close to both of our hearts, is seeing that's how we yeah. uh, pay for our shoes. Um, let's start with music. What do you use in there? Apple Music. I'm in the bag for Apple. And there's a lot of competing services out there. I guess I should back up. I'm using streaming and I'm using Apple Music. Yeah. Uh, I have a big, you know, as we're going through the most recent purge in the house, I found the plastic bin full of CDs that I had ripped ages ago. And I've got those um, rips on my backup drive. And I never look at them. I haven't looked at them in years. But it was kind of fun looking at the CDs, and I told my kids, just go through them, take whatever you want. I'm taking the rest of Goodwill. Uh, but I have, um, I've been doing streaming music forever, and I don't think I'm ever going to go back out of it. Like I, I had like four Dexter Gordon CDs that I'd bought over the years. Uh, Dexter Gordon's one of my favorite jazz players. And now in my Apple Music, I've got like 
16 or 17 of his albums downloaded. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just the renting music. I get it. I'm in. Hopefully, I'll never be so in such bad shape that I can't afford to pay for streaming music because I listen to it all the time. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. Although I did carry forward my let's call it legacy iTunes library of a bunch of stuff that got ripped and then it got some of it got updated with iTunes match. So I, I do have a bit of a a mess in there in terms of the original format or the original location source of the music. But Apple Music, like it doesn't really care about any of that. You can just have it all there together and it's really kind of hard to tell off the bat what is streaming you know that you just added to your library versus what you ripped you know 15 years ago but um yeah apple music apple music here for us for the the whole family we got the you know the iCloud family stuff set up and so everyone has access to it i got a question for you the um so in this process of going through this bin daisy found a cd which is the Mannheim Steamroller plays Mickey Mouse music. I mean, how on earth did that ever get made, right? <laughs> you know, and how did we end up, you know, I know how we ended up with a copy because my wife loves it. But the, uh, I'm like, she's like, I looked it up and it's not an Apple music. Can you add this for me? Mm-hmm. And I, I hadn't thought about it in a long time. It's been a long time. So I got out my, uh, what's it called? Super drive. Super drive. You know? Yeah. yeah, got USB A port on it, and it still works. It'd been buried in a drawer, and uh, still works fine. Plugged it in, stuck the uh, man high meets the mouse in there, and it ripped it into my library. Now, does that automatically share it with her now that it's in my library? I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I have to wait till she gets home today and find out. I don't think it does because iTunes Match is baked into Apple Music. If you're paying for both, you do not need to pay for both. Stop paying for both. Yeah. But I, I don't think iTunes Match applies for the family. But I could be wrong. That'd be interesting to hear uh, in a future episode how that, how that goes. Yeah, I'll follow up in the next feedback episode. But yeah. if somebody knows, they can write in. I, I may have to, uh, to connect the SuperDrive to her, her Mac later tonight. Yeah, or just, you know, airdrop the MP3s or whatever and add them yeah. to her library. I have a similar project. I bought my wife a CD... Uh, for Christmas of a band that um, she's listened to a lot and like they were not on streaming. Like they had two albums. They were not very big. You can't even find them on like, you know, Bandcamp or something. Like they don't yeah. exist. I found a CD on eBay thanks to a save search that I had running for months. And uh, it's been on my desk. Well, honestly, since Christmas to rip it for her. And so this is a, <laughs> <laughs> this is a good reminder for me to do it. And, you want to borrow uh, my super drive, Steven? Yeah, I've got one you. somewhere. <laughs> you need to get on that. Yeah. Well, Apple Music, I think, is great. And I know that there are folks out there that prefer services that maybe have higher bit rates or they they like the... You know, there's a bunch of arguments for and against different services. We should, If we ever really wanted to get on the show, we should have somebody on that uses Spotify daily. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people like their algorithm recommendations. Um. I I don't really care honestly. I Apple Music is good enough and I know what kind of music I want. So I've already got these massive playlists I've put together over the years and they're of my curation. They're not mm-hmm. from an algorithm and I love them and I play them all the time and I'm cool with Apple Music. What what do you think of the um the spatial audio? What do they call it now? They've got a different name for it, I think. I think it is spatial audio. Yeah, spatial audio. Have you played with that much? I don't really care for it. It and this is like a totally a me thing, which also makes me yeah. nervous about this uh, this summer or later this year when the headset comes out. I am yeah. very sensitive for whatever reason to motion sickness or like that sort of category of things. And spatial yeah. audio doesn't make me motion sick, but it makes my brain. I, I, I I feel weird after a while in both modes. So one mode is it keeps track of where your head is in relation to your device. So it sounds like the music's always coming from your device. So if you turn your head, the music kind of pans around with you. And then you have one where you're basically stationary and the sound staged at all times. And it's just like big and surround. And I have the new AirPods pro. I love them to death, but uh, I don't like the way special audio sounds. I don't like the way it makes me feel. And, and, and 
admittedly, I think a lot of that has to do with the music you try with it because some music is sort of forced into the spatial audio pipeline without any remastering to make it work, while a lot of newer music is mastered both sort of a normal stereo, but also with spatial audio in mind. And Apple Music may have both versions and play, you know, whichever one is it's looking for. But it's really not for me. I really don't care for it. What about you? Well, I think it's cool. I mean, I like it. I don't listen to it with headphones on that much, to tell you the truth. But I have two uh, HomePods in the room. And they have a, a playlist called Spatial Audio Jazz, where they've remastered a bunch of stuff. And they've clearly spent some time on it. And this is recordings that were not made for Spatial Audio. A lot of them are decades old. But I think it sounds kind of cool. But, you know, I, as much as I love music, I have a minor third playing with tinnitus in my head at all times. So I'm not the guy to really tell you about the nuances between, you know, high bit rate and low bit rate and stuff. But I, I just like listening to music and uh, I'm glad that some of these old jazz tunes are getting some, some modern love. And uh, I think it's cool, but I, I, I'm not that, uh, I'm not that invested in it either. You yeah. know? <laughs> I've tried Spotify uh, a few times over the years. I, I'm kind of in the camp with you. We're like, I know what I like. I'm not looking for the app or the algorithm to service new stuff to me all that often. Um, and I, for, for us, like the iCloud storage space, all of it, like the math just adds up to use the Apple stuff. And, yeah. and so that's, that's where we are with it. But there are others out there, you know, people swear by title, you know, RDO was a thing back in the day. This is the first music streaming service ever used was RDO. And uh, sometimes I still think about it and miss it because it was really good. But Apple Music has been a really stable part of like not only me, but again, the family's media for a long time, right? We got HomePods throughout the house and someone can just shout out and it plays from Apple Music and don't ever really think about it. We haven't even mentioned classical music and apple now has a new classical music kind of i guess we'll call it a service but you get it for free when you have apple music yeah but it's a um, highly curated and specific list of classical music which is really hard honestly historically to do streaming because there's so many recordings of the same stuff by different orchestras and different eras and uh, apple has tried to make that simpler with the apple music service Um, have you spent much time with it no, I mean, as we're recording, it came out today. Um, I have it installed. I don't listen to enough of that type of music to like make an informed decision about it. So I am hopeful um, that maybe by the time this episode is out, someone who like is really in the classical music world reviews it and so I can understand their point of view on it. Because I guess I understand sort of intellectually, like there's a lot of metadata and stuff that's just, different with classical music, more detailed than classical music. But I would love to know what someone who really cares about it, what they think about it. And if that's you, like sound off in the forums. Uh, we, I'd, I'd love to read that and learn more about it. I feel like it's one of those services, like I installed it, I poked around it, but because I'm not the target audience, I find it hard to come up with a kind of informed opinion about it, if you will. Yeah, I, I like a lot of the impressionist classical music which uh, was a very strong influence on the the original jazz music. And so I, I played with it as well, but I'm not, I'm not down that rabbit hole as much as I am. In fact, if they made a jazz service, I would, I'd go nuts, yeah. but I feel like jazz is so much, you know, it's an American art form. It's not as international as I wish it was sometimes. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. I'm going to get an email for saying that, but <laughs> I, you know, uh, where classical is truly, you know, of the world. I can see why they would start with that, but it'd be cool if they did something similar for jazz. Cause it's the same thing. Those jazz guys were all over the place, re-recording songs and, uh, and the metadata is pretty bad on what's out there now. Hmm. Either way, uh, Apple music. Yeah. I guess we're both in the bag for that one. Yeah. Uh, what about other types of audio, uh, podcasts? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, overcast for me. Uh, I have, Basically, every podcast app out there installed. That's because I own a podcast company. <laughs> like I need to yeah, make sure things to. are working. Uh, but when it comes to my listening, uh, it's overcast, really, for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is it's the fastest to sync and download out of all of these. A lot of these uh, podcast apps take a while to 
seeing something new. And that comes from my background of, again, owning a podcast company. It's like, I want to know when things show up, when they publish. Uh, but Overcast also just, uh, I'm sure people have this experience with their apps. It works the way I think a podcast app should work, right? Marco is somebody who, we had him on the show recently, really cares about podcasts, thinks a lot about the organization and the structure of the app. Now, Overcast isn't perfect. I think its UI in particular is has aged pretty poorly, and I, he's working on that from what he has said on his various shows. Um, I think he knows that there, almost every other podcast app looks better <laughs> than Overcast does at this point, but I don't care that much because it, it, it works really well and the audio is really good. He's sort of pioneered some of the, the smart speed and the vocal stuff that he's doing in Overcast. And as a creator, I don't care about those things. Like if you want to listen to me at 2x, have at it. That means you can listen to twice as many relay shows. Like <laughs> go as fast as you want. It doesn't bother me. But um, Overcast has really been it. I mean, since the, the first test flight beta, I remember where I got it. So he announced it at XOXO, I think, like a long time ago. And then it was in beta that fall. And I was at a concert with a friend of mine. And I got, uh, I think, a Slack DM from him. It was like, hey, here's a test flight to what I've been working on. And I was like, oh, I'm at this concert. I really like should be in the moment, like listen to this band that I love. But it was, um, it was, uh, you know, very tempting to sit there and play with the new fancy podcast app. Yeah. And I mean, he has made changes with the way it looks already. Oh, yeah. What, what I, what I like about it is just, it makes it really easy to navigate chapters, uh, to get related links on the episode you're listening to. And honestly, I haven't tried much else because once I got this to work, I'm not that curious about other podcast apps. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you've got one you prefer, go for it. I mean, it doesn't matter. But that's when I used, uh, I did try after the 16.4 during the beta. I tried using Apple Podcasts. I'm like, yeah, boy, this one is still pretty rough. I, I, you know, it's like just the way the UI is set up, it takes multiple taps. And I just feel like Apple could do better. With that app. I'd like to see that productivity, you know, app improvement thing land on their podcast app because that's the one I'm sure most people use. And the easier you make it to use a podcast app, the more people can listen to our show. But um, that one still needs work, in my opinion. That's the only other one I have an opinion on. But, but I use Overcast and it's fine. Um, the um, I also do a lot of content consumption with audiobooks. Um, like, I, f- I find listening to stories on books like that's where I really like audiobooks. Uh, for years, I would get like, because I read a lot of those productivity books, I can't help myself. And, you know, Amazon's really good at saying, hey, you bought this book for another $6, we'll give you the audiobook too. And um, I would always get sucked into that. But then I found that if it's a good book about, you know, self improvement or some topic I'm interested in getting better at, I actually want to take notes on it and stop and really engage with it. Kind of getting back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. And I find the audio format is no good for that. So what I do with audiobooks now, and I subscribed to Audible years ago, is I just get books with stories that I want to hear or biographies. Biographies are good too. But just things I can listen to while I'm fiddling around in the wood shop or the garden or mm-hmm. washing dishes. And... um so I, I do uh, consume uh, books that way as well, but not really like substantive books. Yeah. Just kind of easy listening, I guess you would say. Sure. I'm really not an audiobook person, which is weird as I'm a huge podcast person. Yeah. Something about it just hasn't ever clicked with me. Now, my wife is a huge audiobook person, and she uses Libby. Uh, which is a great service where you can check out books from your local library or sometimes even other libraries uh, that aren't in your area. Audiobooks, uh, real books, all, all, sorts, all sorts of things. She's a huge Libby user. Um, and she'll, if something's not there and she really wants to hear it, she'll you know purchase, purchase an audiobook usually from, uh, from Amazon or I guess Audible, which Amazon owns. But that, that medium has never really, uh, never really worked for me. And I can't, quite put my finger on why yeah well it just depends what you're into right I mean, yeah i think if i wasn't if i wasn't in this business i i may feel differently because i do like listening to content i listen to a lot of podcasts 
But I think to a degree, even when I'm not listening to a show for work, right, if I'm listening to something not tech related, my mind is always kind of in the work mode and it's hard to break out of that. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Indeed. Go to indeed.com slash MPU and join more than 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. When it comes to hiring, you need to trust your gut. But what if you could give your gut some help? When you want to find quality talent fast, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. So don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching, assessments, and virtual interviews. And if you hate waiting, Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Instant Match really is incredible. As soon as you sponsor a post, you'll get that short list of quality candidates and you can invite them to apply right away. Boom, it's hiring at warp speed. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed knows when you're growing your business, you have to make every dollar count. And that's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. So visit Indeed.com slash MPU to start hiring now. Just go to I-N-D-E-E-D dot com slash MPU. That's Indeed.com slash MPU. Terms and conditions do apply. Cost per application pricing is not available for everyone. Do you need to hire? You need Indeed. And our thanks to Indeed for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. Uh, What about news? How do you consume the news? For me, it's uh, this has changed a lot over, uh, let's call it the last five to ten years, where yeah. a long time ago, I was really plugged in with the news. Uh, and, and by news, I mean like non-tech news, right? Like news news, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I had a lot of, uh, a lot of Twitter lists and people I followed who were reporters, local, national, the whole gamut, reading a lot of news, watching a lot of, you know, uh, news stories on YouTube and that stuff. And as I've gotten older, I've backed way off of that. And really now, my primary way I get news is um, is actually like a, a local online newspaper we have here. Uh, they started uh, maybe four or five years ago. They're digital only. They have a lot of great journalists. They have a big, uh, big, uh, like foundation behind them. You know, it's it's actually a pretty, it's a growing sort of style of local or regional news to be kind of a nonprofit, online only, hire really good journalists. Like, there's a movement in that, and uh, and that's really where I spend most of my time consuming news. Is that it's local or regional news? If there's a big national story, they'll cover it. Um, or I'll, I'll find it. Um, I do listen to, to one political podcast and they cover a lot of news as well, but that's really it. My days of like spending a lot of time doing that are, uh, pretty much over. Now there are times or seasons or events that, you know, I really find myself plugged in for a while and, and then sort of, uh, you know, as the story fades, kind of go back to my sort of usual consumption of that. And, uh, our local paper I'm talking about, they have RSS feeds for everything. And so they're just in a folder uh, in Feedbin called News. I know that's really imaginative, <laughs> but it works for me. And uh, kind of how you do where you said you have like, your tech feeds and everything else kind of separated. I do that with folders in Feedbin and Reader. And so if I'm at work, I'm mostly just checking on the Apple RSS feeds, tech RSS feeds, and then maybe once a day look at that big news folder. Yeah, I um I have evolved with this too. I mean, when I grew up, uh, I'm old enough that we watched the news as a family on t- at TV at night, and it was like a half hour. I remember Walter Cronkite, you know. So, 
it was a thing and we'd watch the news and then the news was over, you know, and it was about 30 minutes and yeah. they, they still teased you with the weather back then too. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it was just a thing. And then at some point news became like a 24 seven thing. Yes. And, and now they really are aiming for viewership and making money and making it lucrative. I feel like the news when I was a kid was really more of a public service and now it, it is a profit driven thing. And and I do feel like where wherever you are on the spectrum, left wing, right wing, wherever you are on that bird, um, there is somebody that is going to try and monetize your interest and get you wound up. And you should be aware of that because that's where the consumption thing becomes unhealthy, you know. And um, so I decided a while ago that I am no longer going to consume any news via video. That was my you know, that was my big move. And, uh, I, what I decided is Apple news, you know, the little app you open on your iPad, cause once again, I'm paying for Apple one. So I get that too. Mm -hmm. If I want to know what's going on in the world, I'll read an article on Apple news, you know, and, and it's not bad, you know, and the articles are pretty summary, but they give me what I need. And I find that I am, uh, I'm much better off watching somebody put a camber on a smoothing plane than, you know, spew politics at me for an hour. So I, uh, I am really actually in a pretty good place with news. And again, time tracking comes in handy because I actually track news consumption and, uh, I like to box it in, you know, I don't want to spend more than a couple hours a week on the news. And that gives me enough to know what's going on in the world without, you know, becoming insufferable. And, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's what I do. And I'm, I'm really in a good place with it now, to tell you the truth. I think everyone falls in a different place on this one, more out of more than any of the others that we've talked about. And yeah, I think having uh, that balance is, is a really personal decision, right? There are people yeah, listening. To this totally. like, you should be more plugged in. You should be less plugged in. Like everyone's different. I, I do wish that Apple news or news plus that I pay for it worked for me. I think there's two things I don't like about it. One, I don't like the algorithm stuff. I mean, you can kind of avoid it in Apple News, but it's like going to a single source and reading everything they have. Yeah. But because ultimately everything's a web view, like a lot of those web pages look like garbage because online display advertising on the web has ruined the internet. And yeah. I'm totally for like classy, well done ads. Uh, the local paper I've been referencing, they got ads. I don't block them. Like they do a good job. They're not, you know, breaking every paragraph up with three ads but a lot of sites do and that gets a little bit annoying i i do keep apple news installed because there are times like the wall street journal or other places a that i that i don't pay for i do pay for a couple of big news services to get around their to you know pay their paywall but some of them i don't and apple news gets you around some of them and so i, I do keep apple news installed for those reasons but i very rarely open it and just poke around very rarely. Uh, if it, there's some big national news story, I may, because I want to kind of sort of open one place and kind of read and see what's going on. Uh, I think out of Apple services, Apple news, like kind of makes me the saddest. Like I think it could be a lot better than it is, but yeah. at the same time, they have to find something that works for them and all of those news providers and everything else. So I, I get that that's a, a complicated thing. Yeah, and I have friends who are very specific about saying, "Hey guys, why don't I um why don't I subscribe to a local newspaper and just read the paper and just skip the internet for this stuff?" And I think that's actually not a bad idea, but I just don't have one around me that I would want to read. Yeah. The only one and, we and have you, is just a a man I could talk all day about this. Um my journalism degree is like really excited at the moment. But yeah. th there's so much in here when it comes to yeah it'd be really awesome if there was a uh, a local printed newspaper that was still good most places don't have one anymore most places are like memphis where you know we have we have still a what what was the local newspaper even as distant or as recent in the past like when i graduated college like in 2011 or whatever a bunch of people i went to school with went there and worked at the print paper and now they, you know, they've been bought and sold so many times. They're just a shell of what they used to be. Memphis is lucky that we have that really good alternative online paper that most of the good journalists in town, they ended up over there. 
But in a lot of places in the U.S. and elsewhere, even if you wanted to get your news that way, it would be hard to do. That's just a business that isn't sustainable anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, it's tough. But, you know, and also the, the part of me, once again, that hates clutter. It's like, you got newspapers all over. I, I grew up with that. It's like, they were always everywhere. You get it on your hands. I, I like the idea of a digital digital thing but but i i keep it pretty simple and and i know that there that there are people out there who will be saying amen and they'll be people out there disappointed in me for saying this but yeah i i just don't um i just don't find you know letting myself go down some rabbit hole of news in an in an economy where the news is generated to try and hold on to you it's just the same as some of these other services we counseled against last week i i feel like if you want to get something done with your life, the news is one more place that doesn't want you to do that. Hmm. You know, the news industry, I guess I yeah. would say, you know, yeah, yeah. keep up with things. Don't get sucked in by them. Yeah. Cause e- even the, the, the most well-meaning journalist out there, and there's still a lot of great people working in this industry, a lot of great people, but the business has just changed so much. It's, it's hard for them to have the, uh, to always have the say that they would have, you know, over their, over their yeah. parent company or publication that maybe they, maybe they would have had that power in the past. Yeah. And, the, you know, it's just one more rabbit hole that can pull you away from the important work of your life. Mm-hmm. So be careful. I'm not saying don't watch the news, but just be mindful of how much time you spend on it. Social media for me is right now the, the area of content consumption that I'm the worst at. And it's not the typical worst at problem with social media. Uh, it's not that I spend too much time. In it. It's just, I just forget that it exists. I don't do much social media. I think it's fine. I mean, we have a, a complicated relationship with it because it is part of our job, right? That's true for a lot of people, right? A lot of people yeah. either have to use social media for like their own, business or their own projects or as part of their like jobby job, right? Like, okay, there, yeah. there's a whole legion of people out there manning social media for their employers. And, uh, it's just part of our world now. I definitely have had a, uh, a very complicated relationship with it over the last year or so wanting to dial it back. And then really what happened, and it's pretty unique to the Apple community. I mean, other communities have had it too, but the Apple community was, it was really stark and fast that our community left Twitter basically overnight and landed mostly on Mastodon, which is really kind of just like Twitter in a lot of ways. And I don't think really solves many of the inherent problems Twitter had, but that's really not the topic for today. Uh, But I found myself in the beginning very resistant to that. Not that I wanted to stay on Twitter and not go to Mastodon, but I didn't want to do any of it. And I kind of had the realization uh, maybe six weeks ago, I was like, well, the community, the relay community is there. And so I need to be there as like continuing to remind people that relay exists and like stay engaged with the audience and stuff. And so for me, I've really made the, the shift to, uh, social media really being under the work category and not under the personal category. And, there's some caveats to that, but at least like text-based social media, like Twitter or Mastodon, I really view that as an extension of work and and not so much something that I would do otherwise, right? Like if, if all this were to go away tomorrow, right, and I got to go, you know, find a job, I don't think you would find me on Twitter or Mastodon anymore. I think it's, I'm really there because the audience is is there and that engagement is important. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I feel a bit similar. I mean, I have a Mastodon account, but I, I, I haven't left Twitter either, but I haven't checked Twitter probably in a month. Um, and I have, I think I have two or three messages on Mastodon and the thing for me just comes down to time. Um, uh, you know, another thing I have is I have a discord server for the Max Markey labs and I'm terrible about not getting in there. I know folks are talking and it seems like they're having fun in there, but I'm not in there very much, which is seems like I should be, right? It's the Max Markey Labs. Uh, why, why aren't I in there every day? And it's just like, 
I look at my day and I'm not goofing around, but I make a lot of content for the labs. I make three podcasts. I make field guides. I mean, I'm putting blog posts up every day. I'm, I'm publishing and shipping in a lot of different forums and social media for me is always the one at the end that I never get to. And uh, I need to probably do a better job of that. And I'm not sure how, what that means. You know, it's like some people say, well, you should get somebody to help you and do social media. I'm like, no, it's social media. If, I, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be me. It's not going to be somebody doing it for me. Yeah, it's tricky. It definitely I, tricky. I don't know. I, I think it's costing me. I mean, I'm sure there are people... Uh, frustrated with me or who don't find me because I'm not engaged in those platforms. And, but I just lately, you know, I'm still kind of in a transition, right? It sounds silly. It's been a year since I stopped being a lawyer, but I'm still figuring out the balance of everything I do. And social media for me is something that I think that I could be better at. I've just got to figure out what that means. Mm -hmm. But to the extent I do social media, I do have a Mastodon. I do have a Twitter. Neither one of them get used much. When I do have time for social media, it tends to be in the Max Parkey Labs Discord, the Relay Discord, or the MPU forums. Yeah. I mean, that is, to the extent I do social media, it's those places way more than it's Mastodon or Twitter. Right, which in and of itself is a change, right? Because those are closed, or in the, in the case of our Discords, paywalled communities yeah right and and that is both good and bad in a in a bunch of different ways um but yeah i I totally get it and one thing i did decide and i think i've done a pretty good job of sticking to it is there's a lot of stuff in the past that i just would have put on twitter like uh last week i had a link on 512 uh i found this like screenshot from ios 5 i made and it has a brown uh ibooks app notification on it It it's like the weirdest looking thing yeah and you know what not that long ago it would have been on twitter or i guess now mastodon and i would like made a little joke about it it's like i have a blog it's read by more people than follow me on mastodon yeah why don't just put on the blog right and so i did and and so i've been trying to make 512 more of a home for that sort of oddball stuff because i control it look Mastodon is going to go away at some point. I'm not saying it's going to be anytime soon. Everything does ultimately, unless you control it. And when, you know, when I'm dead and gone and my kids stop paying the bill, then 512 will be gone too. And hopefully I live on forever in the internet archive. But having control over it is, is something that is important to me. It's not important to everybody. It's probably honestly not important to most people, but it is to me. And, and so I've tried to, take some of that energy and and put it there but it's uh it's hard and and you know we we tacked this on as the last topic because it is a mix of consuming and creating unlike some of the others right you know i'm not making like a video review of ted lasso and sending it to apple you know eddie q would not watch that uh but with social media i can read what people say i can respond i can write my own stuff i can post my own photos or whatever and so it is a little bit different, but it's such an interesting time. Again, specifically in our community, that I think it's it's worth talking about. You know, in the wider world, sports Twitter, news Twitter, politics Twitter, all that stuff is still there. And like, you would never know anything happened, right? All those people are still doing what they've always done. But in our community, our corner of the internet, it really has has changed. And I think it's made all of us sort of have to deal with that and, and reconcile that and decide how we want to, how we want to move forward from it. Yeah. I, and I know a lot of folks like in our community have already like publicly declared they're leaving Twitter and going to Macedon or whatever. I, I think isn't Mike, is Mike Hurley not doing social media anymore? I don't No, He caved. He's on Macedon. Oh, is he? Okay. So like, I, I don't know what everybody's doing, but I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I haven't had time to figure it out. It's like, should I do fewer videos so I can spend time every day on Mastodon? I, I don't know. And, and so right now, the answer for me is don't do anything. Just keep doing what you do and then figure it out later. But but I have, I'm not going to make any big public declaration or anything, but I do very little social media. And I've never been one who was really particularly engaged with it. Even back on Twitter, I wasn't really doing a lot of it so i I don't know if that's good or bad 
but it, it's on my mind because, you know, that's, I'm a content creator. I've got air quotes up now. It's like, should I be doing more of this stuff or should I just be making more content? Mm-hmm. There, there's only so many hours in a day. You got to make a decision. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say that the social media that I think I enjoy the most when I take time to do it is Instagram. Interesting. I like to see what my friends are doing. And, you know, I know that's kind of like fading off now, but like when I see a picture of you working on your truck or something, it makes me smile. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's been a big, uh, another kind of big issue for me is like trying to decide uh, what, you know, where that fits, right? And for me, Instagram is like part work, but then like also like a lot of my real friends... <laughs> follow me there too and they're like why do you have so much computer stuff on there and then I, you know i have yeah. to explain um instagram is one of those apps that i have pretty severe screen time limits on because i do find it to be really easy to like open it and just like you know suddenly i've blasted 15 minutes away that i really needed to be doing something else yeah it, it is i mean it's something where other people monetize my time yep. and that always puts my shields up right mm-hmm. i just want to be careful because I don't have an unlimited amount of time to do what I want to accomplish. And this time I spend helping them isn't helping me on that, on that path. But it is weird because social media is kind of part of what we do and it's a way we can help get our message out there and connect with people. So yeah, I I'm really flummoxed. I don't know. There's a part of me that just wants to say, heck it, heck with it. I'm not just, I'm just not a social media person. Yeah. And then part of, but you know, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I it's tricky for me don't and you know what to do with yeah. work, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can tell you, like, I mean, I said it already, but when this is all over, you know, hopefully a really long time from now, like, my presence online will be drastically different. And um, I don't feel like I can get away with that right now, but hopefully, uh, hopefully soon. And then I guess we've said this before, but I mean, my. <laughs> It's not social media, but what I do in lieu of social media is I make day one entries. I make so many of them, and I like going back and reading them, and it's just for me, and I can say whatever the heck I want. And um, that that is a replacement for social media to a certain extent in my life. Um, And... I'm not that clever. You know, I don't come up with, like, quick, witty things to say on Twitter Mm -hmm. slash Mastodon slash whatever. Uh, I, I'm more of a plotting kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I just I just keep rowing and working, and hopefully I make something good. But uh, either way, there you go. Like uh, it's a uh, it's a tough question, and I don't really have the answer for it. And right now, I'm making a decision by not doing anything, which isn't the way ideally I would like to make a decision. I'd like to actually. Mm-hmm affirmatively decide what my relationship with social media will be, but I don't know what it is right now. Okay. On that happy note, I think we'll stop. Okay. (laughs) Any other consumption categories? I don't know. Let us know if we missed one that you think we should cover, but, uh, but you know, audio video, uh, books and, and words. Those are the big ones. A lot of stuff out there, you know? Uh, I guess the only thing I'm gonna tack one thing as a surprise here on the end. All right. There's a lot of stuff out there, books, TV, whatever. Uh, how do you keep up with things that you want to consume in the future, right? A friend recommends a book. Your wife says, hey, I heard about this TV show. I'd like to watch it together. How do you capture that? Uh, Apple reminders. I got a list. Okay. I got a list for videos. got a list for books. And, um, and I didn't say this earlier, but we've said this on the show in the past. When YouTube starts throwing stuff at me with their algorithm, I just download it with Downey. And then watch them in yeah. my own time. So I, I kind of have cues that I go into for this stuff. Yeah. Uh, mine's very similar. I have a reminders list. I have one that's called to watch and one that's called to read. And, yeah. you know, if someone mentions a book that sounds interesting. I'll just jot down the title of the, of the book. And then every once in a while, I'll go in there and then make the decision if it's something I want to move forward with, right? Being on the list doesn't guarantee you that you're going to be watched or read. It's just a, a, place for me to stick it until uh until further notice and so that is uh that's really the way i recommend it there are some cool apps that do this sofa is one that i really like uh but honestly i just kind of keep coming back to i can just make a list <laughs> you know but if you want something more 
uh, Sofa. Uh, it's an iPhone app. I'll put a link in the show notes. Really well done. It does, uh, like, you can do some lists and have uh, tags and all sorts of interesting stuff if you want to do something uh, a bit more uh, full-featured, if you will. Yeah, I keep it pretty simple. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, we are the Mac Power users. Uh, thanks for listening. How do you consume content? Maybe you've got some cool workflows or ideas. You could share it with us in the forums at talk.macpowerusers.com. Send us a note. Uh, we have a forum on the website, and we always are planning for the next feedback episode. Share something cool with us about the way you consume content. Maybe it'll end up on the show. We want to thank our sponsors, 1Password, Setup, Squarespace, and Indeed. And we'll see you next time.